Well, as you can see, folks, we've made it to Wizard World, and we are actually in the DeLorean that was screen used after the film. And this is still too scale to, to drive the car. I can't believe I'm sitting in it. They're not going to let me drive off with it, because I might actually go back and make the show better from the last uh, couple episodes. But that's okay. So stick around. We're going to have a lot more coverage from Wizard World for The Bro Show. The Bro Show is filmed before absolutely no audience whatsoever. Are you ready? It's time for the hive of the night, the Bro Show! And now, here's everybody's favorite two stepping host, Michael Bro! Oh, hi there! Welcome to today's show. This week's show is a Wizard World exclusive special. That's right, we have lots going on today. We're actually going to be taking a look at Wizard World that happened this past weekend in Philadelphia for 2012. We've been here all three big days, Friday, Saturday, and today is Sunday while I'm taping these segments, but I wanted to make sure you got to see everything that I got to see. We were in some of the panels with not only Dean Kane and Sam Witwer, but we also saw Sam Trammell, we saw the five captains, we saw everybody. So we're just going to show you clips and flips and everything else that we saw at this convention this weekend. So without further ado, let's go right to the first clip. Um, my question to you is if you had a choice to be any villain, what villain would you play? Wow. I mean, first of all, uh, or villains are so know. much fun. There's so much more fun than, uh, right. than non-villains in a way. You know, maybe it's because I mostly play non-villains. But, um, Gosh, uh, you know, it would probably, you know, I'd want to be, I'd want to be a villain in like, you know, a Batman movie, probably, you know, you know, right? Like, get like one of those like superhero villains that you can really kind of do big, kind of events and work with. That's what I like. Do you know? Um, speaking of international, um, how hard is it for everybody to switch into like a southern accent that's like so commonly used in throughout the show? Um, probably harder for some than others. Uh, no, I, um, we, I think everybody, I think in the first season, w w people were kind of finding it, and then it's people, I think everybody's really relaxed into their, into their character. I mean, even for me, I'm from Louisiana and West Virginia, um, and all my relatives have accents, but I kind of lost mine, because I lived in Rhode Island, and I lived in New York, and all over the place. Um, so, you know, even I have to go back and and I'll listen to family that I have recorded. I'm always doing that, you know, just to just to keep it fresh. You know, that's kind of my, my process with that. Yeah. Hi. Um, as you know, in the show, you own a bar for lots. Yep. I wanted to know if you guys had real alcohol in the bar, and if you guys, behind the scenes or on scenes, ever actually drank it. Depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> Friday evening with... Just for you, pal. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow, Sam and Sam were awesome. Sam Whitwear, Sam Trammell, all in the same day. Those guys were really, really cool. But you know who had a really cool story? Dean Kane. Let's take a look at what he had to say right now. What was your favorite episode of Lois and Clark you, um, you played in? Hmm. Well, I wrote a couple episodes, and I would like to say those are my favorite, but then I would be lying, and I won't do that. <laughs> I really did enjoy those very much, but I think my favorite episode, when I look back on it, was... Uh, Maybe the proposal when he uh, when Clark proposed to Lois and it was sort of a cliffhanger at the end and she says, "Who's asking, uh, Clark or Superman?" <laughs> Gee, that's a tough question. Not something you think about every day, that's for sure. Uh, I would have really loved to have been able to work with Christopher Reeve. Obviously, uh, I would have loved to have met him. And when he was alive, I wish I had taken. Um, some real strong, I wish I had really like, had made a big point of trying to go and, and meet him. I wish I had done that. So the Larson Clark schedule worked out to eight days of show, um, and we'd shoot you know, about 18 hours a day, and it was, it was grueling. Ripley's Believe It or Not, for me, was eight days a year. <laughs> yes. And uh, it, was two, it was four pairs of two days. Uh, and I chose which days those were. It was also great. And uh, it was a 10-hour day, then a 7-hour day. Then a 10-hour day, then a 7-hour day. <laughs> so I do that, uh, that four times a year and uh, got paid a lot more for that than I ever got for Lois and Clark. <laughs> Honest to goodness truth. And still, because the uh, Warner Brothers hides their money very well. <laughs> and you can quote me on that. All right, I gotta admit, the Dean Cain panel was really cool. I mean, we got to hear the fact that he made more money off of Ripley's Believe It or Not than he did on Lewis and Clark. Who would have thought that would have happened? Okay, now the last panel that happened on Friday was really, really cool. The one that I saw, or it was one of the last ones I saw. It was the Star Wars panel. Not only did we have Nick Gilliard, the actual duelist and choreographer for all the Star Wars fights and all the Star Wars movies, we saw Peter Mayhew, you know, the original Chewbacca, I won't even try to do the Chewbacca voice. And Jeremy Bullock, who was the original Bubba Fett. I like what he had to say about the fact that Bubba Fett was actually seen in the prequel movies. Let's take a look at a couple of clips from that panel right now. And for Nick, is there any fight sequence or you would have liked to have done it? He basically uh, told you no. Um, it's a lot. When you do Star Wars, it's a very efficient movie to work on. You might do a Ridley Scott movie and you might do, get two shots a day. On Star Wars you get a hundred shots a day. It's so efficient. It's how, how he works it out, how he shoots it. We did a fight um, with six Darth Mauls, effectively. Only one versus six guys with double-ended lightsabers. And it was a beautiful thing. It took me three weeks to do this fight. And then when we got there, because of what had gone on that day, we just didn't have time. He said, I'll tell you what, they come in, he goes like that, he uses the force, he drops a container on the wall. And we're like, oh, that's the best fight I, I ever did. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure like everyone in here like has the same opinion on this, but I just want to hear it from you guys. Who shot first? <laughs> Face. 
around oh. that's something you should never do because you don't know what's going on. Also, to make him a clone, there's nothing. It's just individual. It should be individual. Mm. No, but that's my own feeling. I can understand why George did it, why he decided. And it's good that there's a background story for me. But in a way, I think it would be better to just keep it. You just, today, when we talk about it, what's he look like? Who is he? Where's he from? All the time. Um, I know that you worked with John Berkeley and a few others. And uh, what was it like to work with him and what other work did you do before Star Wars? Well, before Star Wars, uh, I, mean, I started acting when I was 12, mainly because I failed every exam I took. And I remember my English teacher coming up to me and saying, Well, look, you may have nothing in writing, but you have failed again. And it was like a Dickensian master, sort of almost the cane coming out. But then I went to drama school six months later and, and was involved with lots of kids films, you know, adventures where right. you ca capture the crooks, very gentle, good stuff. And then I was in a soap opera for three years, decided to come out because you're stuck with a character. This is when I was 21, 22. Then I did a famous musical called Summer Holiday with Cliff Richard, the famous singer. Okay. And it went from then on, Robin of Sherwood, Doctor Who, William Hartnell, that was the first one, Space Museum. And then I, I did another, we were asked back ten years later, uh, with John Pertwee in The Time Warrior, where I, I'm supposed to be the, the greatest archer in the world. <laughs> well, it wasn't bad, it looked quite good. Uh, and then Mary Queen of Scots, uh, the historical drama, Richard II. So a mixture of Shakespeare, comedy, drama, and if it all ends tomorrow, I've had a terrific career of 55 years. Well, I, I certainly hope it goes much, much longer than that. Well, I hope so. Yeah. yeah. All right, folks, that was a great panel. Now let's talk about day two. Day two, we had a lot of amazing panels. That was Saturday, and that was the huge day. Not only did we have Stan Lee, we also had Chris Hemsworth and some people that were captains on TV. We'll talk about that in a sec. But for right now, let's take a look at the Stan Lee Q&A panel and a few clips from that. I'm very flattered. I don't, I don't really have a favorite. I love them all. And whichever one I was writing at the moment, that was my favorite at the time. But it's like asking who's your favorite child, or, you know, you love all your children. Who's my, well, of course, my favorite person up here on the stand is this young lady. There's no doubt about that. Tell you about him? Okay. Dr. Doom has long been my favorite villain. First of all, I like his name. How can you beat a guy called Dr. Doom? <laughs> and the thing I like about him, he is the king of his own country, Latveria. Now, I'm very proud of Latveria because I made up that name, and I swear it sounds like a real country. <laughs> I've had people say, how do I buy a ticket to Latveria? It sounds so real. But the big thing about Dr. Doom being a king if he comes here to America and he commits a crime, he's got diplomatic immunity. We can't arrest him. And you show me any other villain that can't be arrested because he's got diplomatic immunity. And that's why Marvel has always led the pact. We're different than the All right, folks, wasn't that cool? Stanley is the man. I mean, he is the man with class. And let's just face it, that little kid coming up and getting to shake his hand and then him just turning around and saying, he's awesome, he pretty much summed him up. So, Stanley, excelsior to you, sir. You are awesome. Now, let's take a look at a few clips from Chris Hemsworth and what he had to say about some of his acting in the last few days. You know, he did a little movie called Thor, and then he did some soap acting. Let's talk about that and take a look. Yeah, um, what I... I finished high school, I went and did a couple of drama courses and, and just kind of fell in love with acting and, um, and then did a, a couple of TV shows and did a soap opera for, for three years in Australia, which was uh, some of the best training I could have had. It was like 20 scenes a day and five episodes a week with scripts that 
weren't that good a lot of the time, so you've got to work even harder. And it's the kind of thing you, you're thrown in the deep end and you sink or swim, and, and according to the, you know, you really have to work. And the um, uh, funniest thing, on the spot now, let me think. Um, uh, I mean, there's a constant sort of like costume malfunctions, which, you know, you see the movie and everyone looks very cool and heroic. And, you know, and then you're doing a scene with Loki and one of his horns have fallen off. It's like, well, wait, stop, 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 you know. Glue it back on. And say, Literally, I was like, oh, this is not cool. Um, how about you? Who's your favourite? Okay, Chris Hemsworth, let's just face it, every woman was swooning over Chris Hemsworth. And it's true. I mean, he's dreamy. I mean, come on. He's Thor. Uh, now, sadly, uh, I had to get my prop here. Sadly, I did not get him to sign my Thor hammer, and I think he's already gone for the day. But that's okay. You know what? I'll get him next time. But Thor, you're awesome. You rock. Now, let's talk about the next panel that's going to come up. It's the linchpin of the entire weekend here. That's right, there were five captains from TV. Not only five captains, five Star Trek captains. We're going to talk to, or actually see, Avery Brooks, cool man on campus. Then we're going to see Patrick Stewart, a man with class and style. Then we're going to talk to William Shatner, who doesn't know how to shut up. Then we're going to see Kate Mulgrew, a lady with class. And then, of course, Scott Bakula, who we all know from Quantum Leap. Let's take a look at some clips from the panel right now. Can you imagine how everybody felt when the first woman stepped on the bridge? No, I mean, the people in charge were very, very nervous, right? I was of childbearing years, and I was a girl. I had bosoms, and I had hair. And all of these things did not fit the demographics. You know what I'm talking about? Mr. Stewart, with all due respect, no bosoms, no hair. And um, I was just at the... He said Chris Hemsworth Q&A, and a lot of girls were asking for hugs, but I would much rather hug you than Chris Hemsworth. <laughs> this sentiment is much appreciated. We can't take hugs right now up front, but okay. perhaps uh, you can visit him at his <laughs> Bigger, far more meaningful 
than many of us think. That we are here right now participating in a mythological experience, and that's what fanatics or the hill life will be about. Avery, I'd like you to answer first. <laughs> Is there any chance that we're going to see any of you on Dancing with the Stars? <laughs> Okay, let's face it, Patrick Stewart getting off stage, jumping down and hugging that girl, you're a great man, that's awesome. And Shatner, really, dude, shut up. Okay, you're really cool too. That's, that was a great panel. We're going to be right back after this. This week in Geektastic History. This week in Geektastic History, movie going went mobile. On June 6, 1933, the first drive-in theater opened up in Camden, New Jersey. Originally called Park Inn Theaters, they were the idea of Richard Hollingshead, a fan of the movies and manager of sales in his father's auto company. The idea would catch on and by the 50s and 60s there were about 5,000 drive-in theaters across the country. Today there are less than 500 drive-ins in the country, but each one takes us back to a simpler B-movie filled time. This week in Geektastic History. All right, folks, welcome back. Now, we're here for day three. We're going to talk about some of the clips there. And we're going to go to the first panel that I actually got into, which was the Quantum Leap panel. That's right. Dean Stockwell was there and Scott Bakula. And Scott Bakula, he's really, really funny. I, I could actually sit down with him. Somebody asked him why he doesn't seem to age and what their interpretation of the final episode was. Let's take a look at a few clips right now. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, man. I don't know. That's just uh, no, sorry, it was fantasy. It's this show he decided to end the battle and he show and he did it. Dawn, what the hell's going on in the Your favorite gadget. Like the gadget? Oh, I have a gadget all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and only working gadget. <laughs> uh, hello, and uh, thank you for coming to Philadelphia. Thank you. Uh, I'm a big fan. I have been since I was about 10. Quantum uh, Leap actually used to be my motivation to get all my homework done. Yes. So I can stay up late and watch Quantum Leap. But, um, my question is for you, Scott. Uh, why is it that you don't seem to age? Stan Lee sharing his vitamins with you or something. You look exactly the same in Quantum Leap and Enterprise and Chuck. My question for you is, when was the last time you had those glasses, Jack? <laughs> My second question for you was, did all the studying of your homework, did it lead to anything good? A college degree, so what's that? A college degree. Okay, good. I thank my parents for that too. Okay, good. That's a good deal. All right, folks, that was a great panel with uh, Scott Bakula and Dean Stockwell. They were really great, and you know what? Seeing Scott Bakula again, he's really funny. I'd like to actually just see him talk more in panels. He was just great. Now let's take a look at a few clips from the Buffy Fest panel where we had five actors from both the TV series and the one movie that was made. Yes, Christy Swanson actually played the original Buffy. She was there. We also had Claire Kramer stepping in for a rather over uh, um, hung over Juliet Landau, apparently, as according to James Marsters, who played Spike. Then we also had Amber Benson and Mark Metcalf, the master from the first season. So 
what can I say? It's a great panel. Let's take a look at a few clips right now. I um I, I like that that I got to play a, a, a lesbian character and that we were the first like real long term lesbian relationship on network television. That made me feel like we weren't just making a TV show. We were like making social commentary, and I was really really proud of that. And one of the things I'm most proud of in my career. So. What about from the the movie set? Any memorable moments? Uh, yeah, there are. Um, <laughs> PG-13. Um, we, the movie was uh, a lot of night shooting. I mean, the whole thing was pretty much night shooting. So it was a grueling, grueling, grueling schedule. And um, about three quarters of the way through the filming of the movie, um, our dolly grip got these pins made, like, you know, just like a circle pin that you put on your t-shirt. And it said, uh, Buffy to just say no. <laughs> and uh, that really upset the director. And she got up and she said, cut the lights. And we were down for like two hours. So she was really upset. Uh, yeah, when I, when I was, when Josh cast me, I, I asked him, I knew it was for the full, throughout the whole first season. And I've told the story before, but I asked him, what's the arc for the character? You always want to know sort of something about where you're going so you know how to get there. And he said, it's great because at the end of the season, you kill Buffy. And I thought, this is so good. Does that mean that the second season, if it gets picked up, is going to be called Master the Buffy Slayer? <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, I will always remember the guy that played the stunt spike was a guy named Steve Tartaglia. And he, um, he was a maniac. He came from Hong Kong, and he was a he was a, a the one of the main Caucasian stuntmen in Hong Kong. And in Hong Kong, they don't have a lot of like laws around stunts, so a lot of things that you can get away with in Hong Kong are illegal here. So no matter what they asked of Steve, he was like, ah, piece of cake. That's a huge. <laughs> so I just I will always remember him. He had to take a third story fall onto uh, concrete. But onto, just because of the camp, onto, all he had for a pad was a bush about this big, right? And it was on concrete. And at the last minute, because of camera angle, he had to take the ball on the curb. Like, he had to fall on the curb with only a bush. He had to curb himself. And I will just always remember him doing the gag and getting up like, okay, what's next? You know, we all thought he was dead. Yeah, he was amazing. Uh, I was wondering, is there anything that you guys liked on the show or the movie that you just so happened to take with you when you left? <laughs> Accidentally. I yeah. took a lot of Glory's underwear. <laughs> I was lazy, basically, and it was pretty, so. Okay, guys, what, what do you think? Are those guys absolutely funny and amazing? They are, really, right? All right, now I actually have my friend Kevin, who you all know as the doctor from one of my skits that I have on the show from time to time. He seems to invade my show a lot. We're going to bring him in because he got to meet someone very cool. Hey, Kevin, come on in. Hi, Mike. Hey, Kevin, how are you? I'm fantastic. Fantastic. Gee, I think that's a doctor reference. Needless to say, you met someone, and I see your VIP sticker here. You met a guy named Stan Lee? Stan Lee. And, Stan and, the man. Man, okay, and how did that go? Well, for the photograph, you know, it was pretty cool because I just went high stand, you know, got my picture taken because they really rush you through it. And this morning, I actually got his autograph on that same picture, as we can see here, the doctor meeting the man. And uh, I, you know, said just said good morning to him. How are you? And I said you're an awesome man, Stan. He said thank you, and then I just kept going. Wow. Did you get to shake his hand or anything too, or did? No, that I, I did not get to do that, unfortunately. But this morning, I also went and got my picture taken with the five captains. And when I walked up, I actually said good morning to them, and three of them turned around and said, "Good morning, how are you? Thank you for coming." And it was starting to annoy the people who were taking the pictures because I was taking up time. <laughs> Oops. Well, you know what? Sometimes you just have to have a little fun at Comic Con, and that's exactly what's been going on. How much fun have you had here? Um, a couple hours ago, I was over on the one side and. They're playing some Queen songs. They started with Bohemian Rhapsody. 
and me and some of the vendors all broke out into singing and they played three Queen songs in a row and we sang them all. And I ended up getting a free CD because I rock. Wow. Okay. Now, I have just a couple minutes left here and I have, I've heard this rumor that you high five somebody and your hand is now touched by gold or by geek godness. What, what's the story? Yesterday, our friend Bob and I were walking out. We were getting actually ready to head to the hotel and get cleaned up for dinner. And as we were walking out, Bruce Campbell started walking by. And I just raised my hand to say hi. And the man high-fived me and said, hey, what's up, man? And just kept going. And I was just in shock for a second there. It was cool. Wow. I just have one question. One question on the way. Favorite match of all time that you had. And would you do it again if you could? As many times as I got in the ring and wrestled, it was extremely hard. In one match. That was the match of all time. Right. There were several moments in my career that stand out. One of those, the first one, would be my first major main event. I wrestled Harley Race at the Gill Auditorium when he was the NWA World Champion with a sellout crowd. That put Ted DiBiase out there for the world to see. That was the beginning. The second big moment was the, the lead in to WrestleMania 4. Market Square Arena, first time that wrestling's back on national network television, and I am the central figure in that deal. Rematch with Hogan and Andre the Giant, the whole deal. That was the second moment. My favorite WrestleMania was WrestleMania 6 with Jake the Snake in Toronto, Canada, because we just had a great match. And uh, those were pretty special. Another very big moment, special moment would be uh, uh, Wembley Stadium, 80,000 people, the largest crowd that I ever wrestled right. in front of. So, wow. Those are very pretty cool. big moments. That's amazing, sir. Thank you very much. You I bet. appreciate you taking the time out for us. And again, awesome. Thank you. Does. I will eat your planet like Pac-Man. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, folks, that's it for this week's show. I want to give a special shout out to all the staff of Wizard World Incorporated who did this convention, who run all these conventions here in Philadelphia and several different cities across the country and around the world, actually. I want to give a special shout out to the PR staff that allowed us to get on in here and film a lot of what you saw this weekend from the show here. And I want to give a special shout out to all the fans and cosplayers who let me take their pictures and enjoy their company. Special shout out even to Kevin, you know, this guy who plays a doctor. He's awesome and he let me film him and we did the interview with him as well. He even got to meet Stan Lee, so I'm a little, little, little bit jealous, but that's okay. As always, everybody, remember, have fun out there. If you get to one of these conventions, make sure to stop by and say hi. If you see one of the guys here in the Bro Show shirt, absolutely stop up and say hi. We'd love to talk to you. Remember, as always, have a great day, and you know what you're going to be doing when you end the show. You're going to be rocking on. So rock on, everybody. Mm -hmm.